The NX-01 Enterprise played an instrumental part in Starfleet's first voyages into interstellar exploration and galactic affairs. Under the command of Captain Jonathan Archer, Enterprise and her crew would pave the way for the founding of the United Federation of Planets. When Star Trek Enterprise ended, many of us were disappointed. The final was rushed. We never learned what had happened to the crew of the NX-01. In this video, we dive into the real fate of each NX-01 senior crewman. For the sake of not making this video last a year, we're only focusing on Archer's command crew, so the senior staff of the NX-01. Thanks to members of the Trek Central community for suggesting this video topic. Welcome to Trek Central, I'm your host Captain Jack and let's get into it. But before we do warp into this video, if you want to keep up to date on the latest Star Trek news, lore and more, hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from the team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media for daily updates on the Star Trek universe. Don't forget, if you want to support the channel, you can hit that join button down below to get videos early and also suggest topics for us to make videos on. Okay, engage. As a heads up, most of the content we talk about in this video will come from books, games and other off-screen sources. This is regarded as the Star Trek Extended Universe. Therefore, we'll use footage from Star Trek Enterprise and other sources to aid the information visually. If you want to check out some of the mentioned books, I've left the links in the video description and I highly suggest you do read them. To make life easy, we'll focus on the events before and after Star Trek Enterprise's series finale, mainly as the series final of These Are The Voyages takes place in 2161, a time jump from a previous episode of 2154. During this time, the Romulan War took place, which was a significant event. However, in 2161, the founding of the Federation takes place, so we'll cover events before and after this. Don't worry, we will make the dates clear on screen. Okay, okay, of course, we are going to start with Jonathan Archer. He officially took command of the NX-01 Enterprise in 2151, and would command the Starship for a decade until 2161. Let's see where he ended up. In the latter half of the 2150s, the Earth Romulan War was officially declared. Captain Archer led a task force to liberate Bengaria 7 from the Romulan Star Empire, an engagement recorded as the Second Battle of Bengaria. The First Battle of Bengaria took place on November 8, 2155, and saw the Romulans invade the system and destroy the NX class Discovery, Starbase 1, and the Vulcan Research Outpost. The Second Battle took place on April 2, 2156. Archer gathered 13 ships and ordered them to retake the star system. The battle was mostly successful, with the Starfleet ships also deploying Mako ground units to the planet's surface. Seven Daedalus class starships were destroyed. Later, in 2156, Archer would journey to the Klingon Empire to ask them to aid the United Earth forces against the Romulans. Archer's pleading to the Klingon Chancellor, Marek, was ultimately pointless, as the Klingons officially refused to assist Earth. It's around this time that the NX-01 Enterprise would be refit into the Columbia-class configuration. As forward to 2159, Archer and the Enterprise managed to save a Vulcan scientist known as Terrell from Romulan forces. This proved to be a mistake. Following the Vulcan's rescue, Archer found himself on a series of missions and learned that Terrell was responsible for many disasters in the Alpha Quadrant. This included infecting planets with toxins, destroying Starfleet facilities with the loss of crew members and attempting to use toxins to destroy Earth. Archer and his task force ultimately forced the Vulcan into hiding. Another Starfleet captain would deal with her in the 23rd century. The events we mentioned here come from a Star Trek Legacy video game. Did you play this game? In 2160, Arch would command Starfleet forces at the Battle of Sharon. This pivotal battle between the United Earth and the Romulans ended with a crushing defeat of the Romulan Star Empire. After the intense fighting and engagements, Starfleet and Captain Archer emerged victorious, thanks to the timely arrival of the Andorian, Teloi, and the Vulcan ships. However, the engagement ended badly for Enterprise, and the Starship would have to be towed home. Eventually, the Romulan War was over, and the USS Enterprise was officially decommissioned, mainly because its space frame was too compromised to function properly in the harsh reality of space. The events of the Earth-Romulan War, and Archer's role in this, are covered in the Star Trek Enterprise books Beneath the Raptor's Wing and To Brave the Storm. With decommissioning of Enterprise and the founding of the United Federation of Planets in 2161, 
Jonathan and Archer would be promoted to the rank of Admiral. It was around this time that Archer was diagnosed with a decaying neurological damage, rendering him unfit to command another starship. Dr. Phlox determined that use of a transporter caused Archer's condition. Initially, he did not like being an Admiral, but he realised he could do much good in his new position for Starfleet and the newly established Federation. As of 2162, Archer had assigned the US's endeavour to be his personal flagship. The ship would occasionally be used to meet leaders of other species on behalf of Starfleet and the Federation. His former first officer, T'Pol, had recently assumed command of the Endeavour and was likely a factor in Archer selecting the starship. By 2164, thanks to the work of Dr. Phlox, Archer's neurological degeneration was mostly repaired. In March of that year, Admiral Archer would work with Commissioner Saval to begin negotiations with the Rigelian Trade Commission about joining the United Federation of Planets. During this, Archer would end up in a bit of a mess with a female Rigelian known as Director Hamask. She attempted to frame him and discredit the Admiral due to her family being held by a criminal organisation. Thankfully, Archer's name was cleared and by the end of the year, the reformed Rigel system officially entered the Federation as the United Rigel World and Colonies. Around this time, Archer reconnected with his friend, Danica Erickson. The events here from the novel Star Trek Enterprise, Tower of Babel. In 2156, Admiral Samuel Gardner retired from Starfleet and left the door open for Admiral Archer to succeed him as Chief of Staff. For four years, Archer oversaw many aspects of Starfleet and the Federation. However, he retired from Starfleet on January 1st, 2169. He would then go into diplomatic work, taking up a Federation ambassador position to Andoria, serving until 2175. Archer was then elected to the position of Federation Councillor for the United Earth. Ultimately, Jonathan Archer would ascend to the presidency of the United Federation of Planets in 2185 and serve two terms. That's the end of Archer's storyline. However, there is some unused information from a Star Trek Enterprise episode in A Mirror Darkly. This information would state that Archer died in his home in New York in 2245, one day after attending the christening of the USS Enterprise NCC-1701. An alternative image which did not mention this was used in the episode instead. What do you think of Archer's fate? Following Enterprise's return for its mission to the Delphic Expanse, T'Pol officially accepted a Starfleet commission of a rank of commander. With the outbreak of the Earth-Romulan War in 2155, Captain Archer sent T'Pol to Vulcan to convince T'Pol to bring Vulcan fully into the Romulan War. Unfortunately, T'Pol was unsuccessful in convincing the Vulcans to join the fight against the Romulans. However, she did start an investigation into secretive arms shipments. T'Pol would return and serve on Enterprise for the rest of the war. Paul's mission can be read in the Roman War novel Beneath the Raptor's Wing. Following the formation of the Federation in 2161, T'Pol was promoted to the rank of Captain and placed in command of the USS Endeavour. In the following years, she worked closely with Admiral Jonathan Archer, who, after his promotion, selected the Endeavour as his personal flagship. In September 2162, both Archer and T'Pol travelled together to a Tandara and Conley world to investigate attacks on the colony. In 2163, T'Pol and the crew of the USS Endeavour played a crucial role in the Mute Crisis. T'Pol insisted that Federation and Starfleet needed to come up with a peaceful solution, rather than starting another war. Finally, she was able to convince Admiral Shran, who approved of her plan. As such, both T'Pol and Lieutenant Commander Hoshi Sato surrendered themselves to the Mute and were taken prisoner. Their goal was to communicate with them and convince them to stop their attacks. While a risky plan, it played off, and T'Pol would use a Vulcan mind meld to communicate with the species and forge a ceasefire with Vertians. This adventure is told through the Rise of the Federation novel, A Choice of Futures. It seems T'Pol would have a happy ending. By 2186, aged 98, T'Pol had resigned from Starfleet service and became an ambassador for the Federation. It's not stated if she was the Vulcan ambassador or someone else. She would return to live in her family's house on Vulcan, along with Mr. Tucker and the two children, Tamir and Lorian. Lieutenant Malcolm Reed was assigned to the NX-1 Enterprise under Captain Jonathan Archer in 2151. Fast forward to 2155 and the increasing threat of a Romulan Star Empire, Mr. Reed would contact his Section 31 friend, Agent Harris, for help. Together the pair arranged for the apparent death of Commander Charles Tucker, Enterprise's chief engineer. The goal was for Tucker to gather information on the Romulan Warp 7 program for the organisation. Due to Tucker's apparent death, Reed would become second officer of Enterprise, and in 2156, he was promoted to lieutenant commander. Reed played a vital role in the Earth Romulan War and served on Enterprise throughout the many battles the ship would find itself in. He would still be a part of the crew right up until the decommissioning of the ship and the founding of the Federation. Following Enterprise, Reed served aboard the US Endeavour as Captain T'Pol's first officer. 
However, in 2162, he was promoted to captain and given command of the intrepid class USS Pioneer. Before departing the Endeavour, Dr. Phlox examined Mr. Reed and discovered the use of the transporter had caused severe damage to Reed's body, rendering him unable to have children. Mr. Reed would choose longtime friend, Travis Mayweather, as his first officer on board the Pioneer. He hoped Travis would be the bridge between himself and his new crew. Under Reed's command, the USS Pioneer would go on various missions with Starfleet and the Federation. On one occasion, Reed displayed his tactical command style. When Lieutenant Commander Mayweather's away team was surrounded on a new planet, he detonated a low-yield photonic torpedo in the planet's atmosphere to scare off the locals. While the plan worked, the Chief Medical Officer, Teresa Lau, objected strongly. The wear crisis kicked off in 2165. This was a series of military engagements that lasted most of the year. NX-01 Enterprise previously encountered wear technology during their first voyage. This was the automated repair station technology that also abducted crew members. The crisis kicked off in February 2165 when the Pioneer came into contact with a wear trade station, which had abducted passengers from a local trade vessel. The Starfleet crew mounted a rescue, which resulted in the death of four Pioneer crew members. Admiral Archer and Captain Reed recruited Section 31 operative and former friend Charles Tucker for his engineering skills during this time. Tucker now went by the name Philip Collier because he technically died in 2161. Or was it 2155? The crisis would heat up and the Federation went on the offensive against the wear technology. In the same year, Tucker, still disguised as Chief Engineer Collier, argued of Malcolm that the wear medical technology could repair the damage to his reproductive system. Malcolm would refuse as he did not want to take advantage of a system for his own benefit, not when it cost the lives of so many species. The wear crisis takes place in the Enterprise books, Uncertain Logic, and Live by the Code. In 2166, Captain Reed worked with Charles Tucker to expose Section 31. They had a breakthrough when Admiral Archer's executive assistant, Captain Marcus Williams, came forward with an official testimony about working for a clandestine organization. When Williams resigned, Archer reassigned Mr. Reed to be his new adjutant. The pioneer was left in command of recently promoted Captain Caroline Paris, who Reed had recently begun a relationship with. These events are told in the book Patterns of Interference. That marks the end of Malcolm Reed's story in the Star Trek universe. Unfortunately, Enterprise's Travis Mayweather seemed to have a rough time with his fate. In 2155, following the destruction of the Earth cargo service freighter, Kobayashi Maru, yes, that one, Travis felt he could no longer trust Captain Archer, so he departed Enterprise and joined the crew of the NX-class Discovery, NX-04. Unfortunately, with the outbreak of the Earth-Romulan War, the Discovery was destroyed over Bengaria 7 by the Romulans though Travis and most of the crew managed to escape the ship before it was ultimately destroyed. Following this, Travis was assigned to the USS Yorktown, which was aboard during the Battle of Andoria in March 2156. Travis was seen as having abandoned the NX-01 Enterprise. As such, his image on board the Yorktown and reputation within Starfleet was generally tarnished. He was turned down for every posting he applied for within the fleet. Even the Yorktown crew considered Travis to be a bad luck charm. Eventually, Captain Weiss of the newly launched NX-05 Atlantis accepted his transfer. Mayweather finally felt at home on board Atlantis. By 2156, he had been promoted to the rank of lieutenant. Atlantis, along with the Coalition fleet, would be stationed at Tal Ceti IV, when a massive Romulan fleet entered and successfully took the system. Atlantis was stuck in the gravitational pull of Tal Ceti III, and the crew were forced to abandon ship after Captain Weiss ordered a self-destruct. Travis and some of the crew were able to land on the planet's surface and await evacuation from Starfleet. In 2159, with the Earth Romulan War raging, Travis was serving on board the Republic under Captain Jennings. He saw action during the Battle of Ocado, where he was injured but able to recover. Following the destruction of the USS Franklin Roosevelt in 2160, to which Travis would have been assigned, Archer offered him the helm of the NX-01 Enterprise once again. Travis would serve on board Enterprise throughout the remainder of the Earth Romulan War until the ship's decommissioning. With the founding of Federation, Mayweather joined former Enterprise shipmate Malcolm Reed as he took command of the USS Pioneer. Reed offered Travis a position of first officer aboard the Pioneer and Travis was promoted to the rank of lieutenant commander. Mayweather served on the Pioneer for many years, being involved in many of the major events the Starship found itself in including the Ware Crisis and assisting Admiral Archer on more than one occasion. You can explore some of these adventures in the Enterprise novels, Tower of Babel and Uncertain Logic. By the 2240s, Mayweather had retired from Starfleet and taken command of a civilian Class J cargo tug. Named the SS New Rochelle, the tug would transport future Starfleet captain, James D. Kirk, along with a Leighton family from Earth to Tarsus IV. Ensign Hoshi Sato joined the NX-1 Enterprise in 2151. 
in 2155, with the rise of the Romulan Star Empire threat, Sato felt her skills were not entirely useful on Enterprise and considered transporting off of the ship. Thankfully, Captain Archer managed to change her mind. Sato would serve on Enterprise during the Earth Romulan War and begin a romantic relationship with Mako Commander Major Takashi Kamo. She eventually left Enterprise along with everyone else following the ship's decommissioning and the founding of the Federation. By 2161, Sardo had risen to Lieutenant Commander and served under Captain DePaul as the communications officer on board the USS Endeavour. Her partner, Kimaro, would also serve on board Endeavour as the armory officer. The Vertian Crisis occurred in 2163, and Sato was ultimately responsible for attempting to communicate with the species. This conflict took place between March and April 2163, and involved the Vertians and several other nations, including the Federation. If you're unfamiliar with the species, they are known as the Alachi. This conflict arose when T'Pol and the Endeavour encountered the species and recognized them from Enterprise's early encounter with them. To see a peaceful resolution in the growing conflict, Hoshi Sato and T'Pol accompanied Vertian prisoners back to their ships. Paul, in the end, managed to mind meld with them and show them they are sentient species. This is a very long-winded story, so I recommend you read this one for yourself. It takes place in the Enterprise novel, A Choice of Futures. In 2164, Sato was on board the Endeavour when it was dispatched to the Pagasi star system. Their mission was to settle a dispute between the Tellarite Starfleet Captain Brantic and the human colonists, who had set up a small settlement on one of the asteroids in the Tellarite claim system. Sato was instrumental in preventing the dispute becoming a bigger conflict. Later in life, Sato retired from Starfleet as a lieutenant commander. She would work on perfecting Lingo Code, the most critical element of the Universal Translator technology, which would become a staple of Starfleet for centuries to come. Sato eventually died sometime before 2268. Dr. Flox remained aboard the NX-1 Enterprise during the Earth Romulan War. However, following its conclusion and the founding of the Federation, Flox was assigned to the Federation starship USS Endeavour under Captain DePaul. During his service on the Endeavour, family troubles rocked his career. While his daughter was due to marry an Antaran, the wedding was ruined when Phlox's son, Metus, murdered a popular figure among the Antaran people. This caused massive tensions between the Denoblin and Antaran peoples. The Denoblin government even considered extraditing Phlox's son. Eventually, cooler heads prevailed. This story is told in the rise of a Federation novel, Live by the Code. By the 2250s, Flox had become a teacher at Starfleet Academy. In the early 2260s, Flox resigned his position and went to do some exploring, at which point he would fill in as a temporary doctor on the planet of Epsilon Zeta 7. It was here he would assist USS Enterprise Chief Medical Officer Dr. Leonard McCoy, along with Dr. Mbenga and Nurse Christine Chapel, in finding a cure to a virus that was affecting the Zeta 7 outpost. We presume Flox had passed away at some point within the 23rd century. However, the doctor's influence was widely known. For example, the Phlox Prize for Medicine had been named in his honour. Dr. Ofeli Beck received his prize in 2241. By the year of 2376, a medical research facility had been named the Phlox Institute in his honour. Dr. Catherine Pulaski would serve there until at least 2379. By far, we're leaving the best man till last. Okay, mainly his trip Tucker story is a little bit complicated due to the death. In Star Trek's extended canon, Tucker's death remained classified for 250 years. In reality, Tucker was forced to fake his death in 2155, just days before the foundation of the Coalition of Planets, which was the precursor to the United Federation of Planets. Star Trek Extended Canon argues with the established date here, but just keep following. Commander Tucker had actually been recruited by Section 31, the rogue spy agency. His mission was to infiltrate the space of a Romulan star empire and sabotage the Romulan's research into developing a Warp 7 star drive. To facilitate this, Tucker underwent reconstructive surgery to fit in behind enemy lines. Tucker and another Section 31 agent were the first humans to see the true appearance of a Romulan people and realize their kinship to the Vulcans. Section 31 would keep this information under wraps, fearing that if the link between the Vulcan and Romulan people were to be discovered, it would shatter the still fragile coalition of planets. And here comes the confusion. At some point, the date of Tucker's apparent death was changed in the historical records. This new date of 2161 aligns with what we see in the Enterprise series finale episode, these other voyages. The Enterprise novel, The Good That Men Do, explores this further, and I highly suggest you give it a read. We've actually done a full breakdown on Tucker's survival here on the channel. You can check that out along with other Trek Central videos. Do enjoy, hopefully it gives more context 
why Tucker faked his death. With the conclusion of the Earth-Romulan War, Tucker would return to Federation space. He would continue to assist Section 31. On one occasion, in 2163, Tucker worked with Admiral Archer to stop the Orion Syndicate from sabotaging the early efforts of the Federation. These events took place during the Vertian Crisis. At this point, Archer became increasingly uncomfortable with Trip's involvement in the Section 31 agency. Trip thought he had changed too much and refused to leave. During the Ware Crisis, Tucker took on the alias of Philip Collier and served as a temporary chief engineer aboard the USS Pioneer, under Captain Reed. Eventually, after learning that Section 31 had begun to work against the Federation's interests, Tucker left the organization. These adventures occur in the Enterprise novels Uncertain Logic and Live by the Code. By 2186, Tucker had assumed the name of Michael Kenmore. To ensure his secrecy, he had more cosmetic alterations done to his face. The Interpol had relocated to Vulcan by this point in time, where they eventually had two children, Tamir and Lorian. Most people believe that these children were of T'Pol and Koss's relationship. Tucker would now live with T'Pol at her ancestral home on Vulcan. These later adventures of Tucker are told with the Enterprise novels To Brave the Storm and Last Fall Measure. Here's a fun fact. The name Michael Kenmore references actor Connor Trenier's character in Stargate Atlantis. To learn more about the Stargate universe, check out our Stargate Central channel linked below. In the 23rd century, Tucker actually contributed to the design and development of a Constitution-class starship by leaving notes placed in the margins of the plans when the class was still in the design phase. One of Tucker's last recorded bits of information on his whereabouts was his visit to the Starfleet War Memorial. Although this sign of reflection he was looking for was made impossible by two young boys, Sam and James Kirk. Charles Tucker is the namesake of a Tucker Memorial Building on the grounds of Starfleet headquarters. In the 24th century, this building has the offices of Starfleet's Corps of Engineers, Command Liaison. So, that is the fate of the NX-01 crew, or Archer's crew as we know them. It's a bit of a long-winded explanation, but we got there in the end. If you want to explore more of the crew's adventures, I have left the books we mentioned in the video description below. Let's continue the Enterprise adventure. Check out our video on the end screen now, which is all about the legacy of the NX class from Enterprise. Did you know how many of these ships existed? If you want to keep up to date on all the latest Star Trek news, lore and more, then make sure to hit that subscribe button to never miss a video from a team here at Trek Central. You can also follow us on social media or join our community Discord server. For now, I've been Captain Jack. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Live long and prosper, my friends. Goodbye.